there's a bigger dream waiting for you, just waiting for you to step into it. Everything you try to do is already done. So when I figured that out, oh, what I'm putting out is what's coming back. Let me get real clear about what it is I'm putting out. Real clear. So I read a book about 1989 called Seed of the Soul. And in that book, Gary Zukav talked about the laws of karma, of the laws of cause and effect, the third law of motion. And in that book, he talked about how intention, your intention is always one with the law. Meaning, before you even think about a thing, you have an intention for the thing. And that the intention is going to determine the outcome. That's why the same people can go to the same church service and somebody walk down the aisle just to be seen to put some money in the church and somebody else who just goes and just has a little bit to offer. The intention with which you give, the intention with which you serve determines the outcome. So when I figured that out, I went, whoa, I changed everything I did on my show. I called in the producers and I said, from this day forward, I will no longer be speaking to the KKK. I will no longer be speaking to people who are fighting each other in a way that it is damaging to the character of myself and other people who watch. From this day forward, I am only going to do intentional television. So it is my intention, my intention to fulfill the dream of the Creator. It is my intention to live to the highest calling and be pressed to the mark of the highest calling that I have come to do. And when you can ask the Creator, ask that which made you you, what is your dream for me. I guarantee you, instead of you trying to define the dream, what is your dream for me? If you're able to lean into the dream that the universe and all the forces of, 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 of light and love and power and grace by all the names that we call God has for you, nobody can touch you. Every single day, I would have a pre-show meeting and have the producers come in and state to me, what is your intention? How do we want to use whoever is on this show, whatever is happening on this show, to serve the audience in a way that fulfills the mission of uplifting, enlightening, encouraging, as well as entertaining. And if it doesn't do that, then I can't do it. There's a bigger dream waiting for you, just waiting for you to step into it, to step into it. Your life is big, your life is huge. And we spend so much time wanting to be in somebody else's life. And you don't get honored, you don't get revered, you don't get celebrating wanting what somebody else has because that which created you, divine intelligence that dreamed you from before your ancestors ever knew they would become your ancestors, that which dreamed the seed of you wants you to know how special, how wondrous, how mysterious, how complex, how glorious, how phenomenal you are. And you get no credit messing in somebody else's territory or trying to have power 
over something you have no control. Another one of my favorite teachings is the Wizard of Oz. When the witch, Wicked Witch of the West says, go away from here because you don't have any power here, you have no power in any territory other than your own. Oh, but you are the master of that. You get to be the master of your own fate. You get to be the captain of your own soul. And if you just manage that, if you just took care of your territory, oh, the glorious, 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 wondrous, wondrous opportunities and possibilities that are waiting for you. So the question is, what are you resisting? What are you pushing against? What are you not allowing? What are you blocking? Because you have this idea of who and what you're supposed to be instead of leaning into the dream that's already been created and waiting for you. It's waiting for you. And the second, I mean, it doesn't, it's an instant thing. It's a shift in the way you see yourself and the power from which you have come. I went through some tough times after, after I left the Oprah show. I made a conscious decision that when I felt I had said all that I could say and the audience had heard it, that I would move on and that I would not spend my life regretting or trying to hold on to what used to be or hold on to what I had. So I dreamed this dream of starting a network. And in the beginning, it was, it was a struggle. It was a struggle because I didn't, I, I, honest to goodness, I did not know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out. I thought that the Oprah show audience would follow us to own. And then I realized y'all didn't have cable. And if you had cable, you did not have the own package. So, so it took me a minute. And unlike most people who you get to have your mistakes in private, some don't go right in your life, you get to sulk about it in private. If I make a mistake, it's on the CNN crawl or the CNN news. So when I was in the climb and there were so many wonderful owners, I see Cheryl Action Jackson here. There were so many wonderful owners, people who said, oh, we're gonna stand with you. We're gonna stand by you. Thank you, Roland Martin. There were so many people who said, listen, we believe that this can happen. So I dreamed the dream along with Tyler Perry, who was my friend who came to me and said, Tyler, Tyler said, I'm gonna help you out because Tyler can go home and write a script and direct it, produce it, and shoot it, and do it for less money than anybody in Hollywood. So we started with the foundation of have and have nots. If loving you is wrong, love thy neighbor, Mama Hattie. And then I started to dream another dream about scripted television because in the beginning I was told you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, didn't have enough money to do it. And I dreamed the dream. I read Proverbs 11:28 that says, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will rise and thrive like a green leaf. It was very difficult for me to figure out where my boundaries were because I'd grown up poor and didn't have anything. So it's easy when you don't have anything and people ask you for money. And they say, I need 500. And you say, I don't have it because I'm just trying to get my rent paid. It's harder when your multi-billion dollar salary is now in the paper and you get a lot of friends and cousins you didn't have before. So how do you set boundaries for yourself. I was having trouble setting boundaries myself for myself for even strangers. People would just show up at my door in Chicago and say, Oprah, I left my husband, please help me. And I would because she knows I have it. So what I learned was is that, oh, the reason why people keep showing up is because my intention is to make them think that I'm such a nice person that you can ask me for anything 
you can get me to do anything. I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna say yes. So when Stevie called me this time, I thought I'd try out my first no on Stevie. Let's start big. He wanted me to donate some money to a charity and I didn't want to donate to the charity because I have my own charities and I care about a lot of people, but the, the, the problem is when you, you have money, everybody thinks you just want to give to everything. So every letter I ever get starts with, we know you love the children. Yes, I do love the children, but somebody else is going to have to help the children. So I said to Stevie, uh, I said to Stevie, no. And um, as a person who has that disease to please, I was waiting for him then to, to say, I will never speak to you again. I will never call you. I will never sing a song for you. And he didn't. He just said, okay. Okay? Okay, it's okay? He said, okay, check you later. And what I learned from that is, Many times you will have angst and worry about things and put yourself in a state when the other person really isn't even thinking about you. So learning that I could specifically determine for myself what the boundaries were for me, what I wanted to do, give my money, give my time, give of my service to who I wanted to give it to when I did, that I get to make that decision. And just because you get a hundred requests a week doesn't mean you have to try to fulfill all of that. Just because you have all of these demands on your time and on you doesn't mean that you have to say yes. You get to decide because you're the master of your fate. The captain of your soul, as William Ernest Henley said in Invictus. And understanding that really changed the meaning of my life in that I was not no longer driven by what other people wanted me to do, but took charge of my own destiny, making choices based upon what do I feel is the next right move for me. Quincy Jones discovered me. And it's so interesting to me because when I was uh, working as a television newswoman in Baltimore, and really all I wanted to do was be an actress, but I was doing television. And I felt at the time, well, I, I can't quit this job because this is what everybody else wants to do. And if I quit this job, what am I going to do? Um, and I was going to a speech coach at the time that the station had sent me to. They, you know, they ever, the broadcasting school, they sent everybody to the same woman. And I was telling her, you know, I really don't want to do this. What I really want to do is act. And she says, my dear, you don't want to act because if you wanted to act, you'd be doing it. What you want to be, my dear, is a star. Because um, if you wanted to act, you'd be waiting tables in New York. You'd be, and I thought, now why am I going to wait tables if I'm already working in TV? So I said, well, what I think is going to happen is I will be discovered because I want it so badly, somebody's gonna to have to discover me. And she said, you just dream. You dream, you're a dreamer. So when it happened, I called her up. I said, you will not believe this. I got discovered. And it really was a discovery. It's like one of those Lana Turner stories, only um, it wasn't a drugstore. He was uh, in his hotel room, saw me on TV. It was unbelievable. So the interesting thing about that is that I, I truly believe that Thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change power and success in the world. Everything begins with thoughts. I mean, the chairs that we're sitting in, the room that we're in, all started because somebody thought it. So I thought up the color purple for myself. I know this is gonna sound strange to you. I read the book. I, pa I got so many copies of that book. I passed the book around to everybody I knew. If I was on the bus, I'd pass it out to people. And when I heard that there was going to be a movie, I started, I started talking it up for myself. I didn't know Quincy Jones or Steven Spielberg or how on earth I would get in this movie. I'd never acted in my life, but I, I felt it so intensely that I had to be a part of that movie. I just, I, I really do believe I created it for myself. I wanted it more than anything in the world and would have done anything to do it. Anything to do it. Turn your wounds into wisdom. You will be wounded many times in your life. 
You'll make mistakes. Some people will call them failures. But I have learned that failure is really God's way of saying, excuse me, you're moving in the wrong direction. It's just an experience. Just an experience. I remember being taken off the air in Baltimore, being told that I was no longer be, being fit for television and that I could not anchor the news because I used to go out on the stories. And my own truth was, even though I'm not a weeper, I would cry for the people in the stories, and uh, which really wasn't very effective as a news reporter to be covering a fire <laughs> and uh, crying because the people lost their house. Um, and it wasn't until they, I was demoted as a on-air anchor woman and thrown into the talk show arena to get rid of me that I allowed my own truth to come through. And the first day I was on the air doing my first talk show back in 1978, it felt like breathing, which is what your true passion should feel like. It should be so natural to you. And so I took what had been a mistake, what had been perceived as a failure with my career as an anchor woman in the news business and turned it into a talk show career that's done okay for me. What drives you to keep working so hard? You could, you know, you and I are in the 60s category, and so when you're in your 60s, you know you've lived more than you're gonna live, yeah. realistically. So when you realize you've lived more than you're gonna live, you can say, why not relax a little bit? Why not just ease up? Why have you decided to even work harder than you did before? Because I think, David, that everybody, you know, the thing that works for me all these years, whether it was the magazine or, which I still have, or whether it was the show, I could, I understood that there's a common denominator in the human experience. And I want the same thing you want, which is the same thing you want and you want. What we all want is to be able to live out the truest, highest expression of ourselves as a human being. That doesn't end until you take your last breath. What is the truest, highest vision that you hold for yourself? No matter where you are in your life, there's always the next level. There's always the next level to the last breath. So I feel that I always knew that I would get be done with the show when I felt like, oh, I've said as much as I could say here on this okay. platform. And then how will I be used? I feel that until you have used your value as a human being, you're not done. I first started as a broadcaster, I was 19, very insecure, thrown into television, you know, pretending to be Barbara Walters, looking nothing like her, and still going to college. So I do all my classes in the morning from 8 to 1, and then the afternoon I work from 2 to 10, and did the 6 o'clock news, and would stay up and study and all that stuff, at, you know, until 1, 2, or 3 o'clock in the morning, and then just start the routine all over again. And my classmates were so jealous of me that I remember, like, taking my little $115 paycheck and, um, at the time, I thought it was really a lot, but taking $115 and tr trying to appease them. I would like, always, anytime anybody needed money, I was always offering, oh, you need $10? Or taking them out for pizza, ordering pizza for the class and things like that. Trying to, that whole disease to please, that's where it was the worst for me, I think, because I wanted to be accepted by them and could not be. Because first of all, I didn't have the time. They wanted, wanted me to pledge and I didn't have the time to pledge. I, was, I didn't have the time to be a part of all the other college activities or a part of that whole lifestyle and it was very difficult for me socially really one of the worst times of my life because I was trying to fit in in school and be a part of that culture but also trying to build a career in television it's very difficult for me to even see myself as successful because I still see myself as in the process of becoming successful to me successful is getting to the point where you are absolutely comfortable with yourself and it does not matter how many things you have acquired. Uh, the ability to learn to say no and not to feel guilty about it, to me, is about the greatest success I have achieved. Uh, the fact that I have, you know, in the public side, done whatever is fine. It's all a part of a process for, for growing for me. But to me, to have the, in, the kind of internal strength and internal courage it takes to say, no, I will not let you treat me this way is what success is all about. It's the same thing that prevents you from being abused as a child, that prevents you from being abused as an adult, that allows you to build success for yourself. I will not be treated this way. I demand 
only the best for myself. You are worthy to say no. You are that it's okay if you say no. It's okay if you say no and then people don't like you. That's really okay. The important thing is how you feel about what you're doing, how you feel about yourself. It's a long struggle though. It's a long struggle. And I'm just hoping that, you know, in the work that I do on the show and the speaking that I do around the country and that young people who are watching this can get the lesson sooner than I did. Because it's painful because you keep repeating it over and over and over until you get it right. And what I found is that every time you have to repeat the lesson, it gets worse because it's, you know, it's I, I call it God trying to get your attention, the universe trying to get your attention. So we didn't get your attention the first time, so we're going to have to hit you a little harder this time. So I'm still doing it. I'm still learning. Create the highest, grandest vision possible for your life because you become what you believe. When I was a little girl, Mississippi, growing up on the farm, only buckwheat is a role model, watching my grandmother boil clothes in a big iron pot through the screen door because we didn't have a washing machine and made everything we had. I watched her and realized somehow inside myself and the spirit of myself that although this was segregated Mississippi and I was colored and female, that my life could be bigger, greater than what I saw. I remember being four or five years old, I certainly couldn't articulate it, but it was a feeling, and a feeling that I allowed myself to follow. I allowed myself to follow because if you were to ask me what is the secret to my success, it is because I understand that there is a power greater than myself that rules my life. And in life, in life, if you can be still long enough in, in all of your endeavors, in the good times, the hard times, to connect yourself to the source, I call it God, you can call it whatever you want, to the force, nature, Allah, the power. If you can connect yourself to the source and allow the energy that it is your personality, your life force to be connected to the greater force, anything is possible for you. I am proof of that. I think that my life, the fact that I was born where I was born in the time that I was and have been able to do what I've done speaks to the possibility, not that I am special, but that it could be done. I have paid attention to my life because I understand that my life, just like your life, is always speaking to you, where you are, in the language, with the people, with the circumstances and experiences that you can understand and interpret if you are willing to see that always life, God, is speaking to you. Now, it took me a while to actually really get this and to understand it, but once I did, I started paying attention to everything. And one of the reasons why I can now accept the fact that I can offer my gatherings of information and wisdom and call myself a spiritual teacher, is that every single person who ever came on my show, and I hear there's like 37,000 guests I've talked to, a lot of them came from dysfunction and a lot of them wouldn't appear to be teachers, but every one of them had something to say that was meaningful and valuable and that I could use to grow myself into the best of myself, which is what all of our jobs are. Your number one job is to become more of yourself and to grow yourself into the best of yourself. I remember when I started the school and I said to my uh, beloved uh, friend, Maya Angelou, I said, Maya, I'm so, I'm so, just so proud that I was able to create this school. And I said, this is going to be my greatest legacy. And Maya said to me, you have no idea. Because your legacy is every life you've touched. And that shifted the way I saw legacy or what you leave behind or what you do. Because Maya ex was explaining to me that, you know, 
over all the years of watching your show, everybody who decided that they were going to go back to school or lose weight or no longer hit their children or get out of a bad marriage, all of those people who have seen and experienced your voice. And the same thing with everybody here. Your legacy is every life that you've touched. And we like to think of it. I know you have done amazing things with your philanthropy. We like to think that these great philanthropic moments are the ones that leave the impact or will make the huge difference in the world. But it's really what you do every day. It's how you use your life to be a light to somebody else's, you know? And it's how you use your work as an expression of your own art, whatever that is. Close your eyes for a moment, will you please? And breathe with me, just close your eyes. And if you will, put your thumb to your middle finger and gather your other fingers around and let's feel the vibration and pulse of your personal energy as you take three deep breaths with me. Inhale. And as you exhale, just feel the vibration, energy, blood pulsating through your body, through you. And another inhale. And another inhale. And keep your eyes closed. And let's just think about this day. This day that you have been graced to breathe in and out thousands of times. This day where many of those breaths were taken for granted, you just expected the next one to come. But the truth is there's no guarantee that the next one comes. This day, how you started your day, what your thoughts were this morning, how you've carried yourself through this day, how you've been allowed to have encounters and experiences, some challenging, some more life enhancing, that pushed you forward another day of being here on the planet Earth as a human, being. Let's just think about that. After all you've been through, in this day alone, and the many days and years past, how you got here to this prestigious, esteemed university, the choices you made that have brought you to this day, Open your heart and quietly to yourself. Say the only prayer that's ever needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're still here and you get another chance this day to do better and be better. Another chance to become more of who you were created and what you were created to fulfill. Thank you. As I've grown older, I've learned to appreciate living in the moment, and I ask that you do too. I've asked 
I'm asking this graduating class, those of you here, I've asked all of my viewers in America and across the world to do this one thing. Keep a grateful journal. Every night, list five things that happened this day in days to come that you are grateful for. What it will begin to do is to change your perspective of your day and your life. I believe that if you can learn to focus on what you have, you will always see that the universe is abundant and you will have more. If you concentrate and focus in your life on what you don't have, you will never have enough. Be grateful, keep a journal. You all are all over my journal tonight. Your real job in life is to figure out what it is you are called to do. And you use a job until you can figure out what the calling is. Because a job is necessary to survive and you live in a world where you... So in my early days, I had a job. I had a job until I could figure out what it was really what that gave my life its purpose and meaning. And um, I had gotten demoted in my job in Baltimore as an anchor woman because as they hired me and then they decided I was the wrong color and I was the wrong size and I was the wrong, you know, I had lots of problems and they were trying to take me off the air. And they, they put me on a talk show one morning because um, they didn't know what to do with me. But I felt like this is what I'm supposed to do. All these years I've been misplaced in news. So, but the moment I did that talk show, I felt like, oh, I can be myself. And that was uh, August 14th, 1978. And that was the beginning of fulfilling the calling. If you can find what is your passion, if you find what you love, you never get tired. Or if you do get tired, it, you, you're fueled by the energy of your work. So I know that I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing at this time. I also know that what this, this show can do in terms of being um, a voice in changing the world. It's just the beginning of what this show can do. It's fun to do things like this, but, uh, and it's necessary to do things like this in order to be able to do the bigger, grander things, to change what happens to, to the face of children in Africa, for example, or what happens to education with kids in, in this country. So I believe that, um, that what has happened to me is really the beginning of the greater passion to come. But if you find out what you're supposed to do, and you know what you're supposed to do by how it, how it feels, and so you know what, if you're doing the right thing, if it feels like it's right to you. And when you hit the thing that feels right, when you know it's the right thing, you, would, you know it's right because it gives you your juice, and you know it's right because you would do it for nothing. You would do it for nothing and find a way to be able just to do it in order to be able to continue that's how you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. There were many days that I sat in my chair across from one or two or five or six or seven people, and I would be so frustrated because I just wanted to shake people sometimes and say, why didn't you pay attention to your life? I said on the show probably the producers tell me that they count it 33 times, but I know I thought it at least a thousand times. I would say listening to your life as it whispers to you first so that it does not have to knock you upside the head with a brick or come crashing down on you as a brick wall is one of the greatest principles of life because there are many things that happen in life that are beyond our control. Natural disasters, death, unexplained events. But there are also many, many, many things in life which we can control and become out of control because you're just not paying attention. You are sleepwalking through your life. And I have seen this so many times on the show. I wanted to take the guests and go, would you just pay attention? So this is what I've learned and how I've explained it to myself. Life whispers to you all the time. Your life is speaking to you all around from the time you wake up in the morning and every single experience that's coming into your personal space. 
into your physical space. All of those experiences are speaking to you. They're telling you something about your life and about your circumstances. It whispers, and if you don't get the whisper, the whisper gets louder. If you don't get the whisper when it gets louder, it gets, I call it like a little pebble, like a little thump upside your head. When I was a kid, if I was doing something my grandmother didn't like, she'd just turn around and thump me. She wouldn't even look at me. She'd just give me a thump and I'd know, that's, that's my cue to stop it or you, we're gonna get worse. The whisper is the message, the pebble or the thump upside the head, Usually it's gone into a problem. You don't pay attention to the problem. The problem becomes a brick upside your head. The brick upside your head is a crisis. You don't pay attention to the brick upside your head. The crisis turns into a disaster and the whole house brick wall comes falling down. Many of you, as I have been, as I am, are where you are in your life based upon what you believe. And it's not just what you think you believe on the surface, it's also your shadow beliefs that are holding you back from moving into the life that you believe you deserve. What I know is if you're not looking at the shadows, if you're not looking at what is subconsciously running through the tape in your mind, telling yourself you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, you're not smart enough, you're not enough, which is a tape that's playing for a lot of people. If you're not conscious of that, then you end up acting out of that belief system and not out of what you know to be the truest or want to be the truest for yourself. But you don't become what you want because so much of wanting is about living in the space of what you don't have. So if you start to think about that, really, why are you where you are in your life? The choices that you have made have been because of what you believe to be true for yourself. But I have always had the deep understanding for myself that if anything was going to move forward in my life, that I was going to have to be responsible for making that happen. And I know that to be true now and can articulate it as you are responsible for your life. And if you're sitting around waiting on somebody to save you, to fix you, to even help you, you are wasting your time because only you have the power to take responsibility to move your life forward. And the sooner you get that, the sooner your life gets into gear. This is what I know from doing 25 years and thousands and thousands of interviews on The Oprah Show. It does not matter where you come from. I have seen people come out of the desert, walk across the desert, being born in the most dire of circumstances. Doesn't matter what your mama did, whether she did or had a PhD or no D, what matters is now, this moment, and your willingness to see this moment for what it is, accept it, forgive the past, take responsibility, and move forward. My one hope today is, is, to, is that I can be a source of some inspiration. I'm going to address my remarks to anybody who's ever felt inferior or felt disadvantaged, felt screwed by life. This is a speech for the quad. Well, I was on television by the time I was 19 years old. And in 1986, I launched my own television show with a relentless determination to succeed. At first, I was nervous about the competition, and then I became my own competition, raising the bar every year, pushing, pushing, pushing myself as hard as I knew. Sound familiar to anybody here? Eventually, we did make it to the top, and we stayed there for 25 years. The Oprah Winfrey Show was number one in our time slot for 21 years. And I have to tell you, I became pretty comfortable with that level of success. But a few years ago, I decided, as you will at some point, that it was time to recalculate, find new territory, break new ground. So I ended the show and launched OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. 
One year later, after launching OWN, nearly every media outlet had proclaimed that my new venture was a flop. Not just a flop, but a big, bold flop, they call it. I can still remember the day I opened up USA Today and read the headline, Oprah not quite standing on her own. It, it, it really was, this time last year, the worst period in my professional life. I was stressed and I was frustrated and quite frankly, I was, I was actually, I was embarrassed. It doesn't matter how far you might rise, at some point you are bound to stumble because if you're constantly doing what we do, raising the bar, if you are constantly pushing yourself higher, higher, the law of averages, not to mention the myth of Icarus, uh, predicts that you will at some point fall. And when you do, I want you to know this, remember this, there is no such thing as failure. Failure is just life trying to move us in another direction. Now, when you're down there in a the hole, it looks like failure. So this past year, I had to spoon feed those words to myself. And when you're down in the hole, when that moment comes, it's really okay to feel bad for a little while. Give yourself time to mourn what you think you may have lost. But then, here's the key. Learn from every mistake. Because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes, are there to teach you and force you into being more of who you are and then figure out what is the next right move. And the key to life is to develop an internal, moral, emotional GPS that can tell you which way to go. But the challenge of life, I have found, is to build a resume that doesn't simply tell a story about what you want to be, but it's a story about who you want to be. It's a resume that doesn't just tell a story about what you want to accomplish, but why. A story that's not just a collection of titles and, and positions, but a story that's really about your purpose. Because when you inevitably stumble and find yourself stuck in a hole, that is the story that will get you out. What is your true calling? What is your dharma? What is your purpose? For me, that discovery came in 1994 when I interviewed a little girl who, who had decided to collect pocket change in order to help other people in need. She raised $1,000 all by herself, and I thought, well, if that little nine-year-old girl with a bucket and a big heart could do that, I wonder what I could do. So I asked for our viewers to take up their own change collection, and in one month, just from pennies, and nickels and dimes, we raised more than $3 million that we used to send one student from every state in the United States to college. And together we built 55 schools in 12 different countries and restored nearly 300 homes that were devastated by Hurricanes Rita and Katrina. So the Angel Network, I've been on the air for a long time, but it was the Angel Network that actually focused my internal GPS. It helped me to decide that I wasn't just gonna be on TV every day, but that the goal of my shows, my interviews, my business, my philanthropy, all of it, whatever ventures I might pursue, would be to make clear that what unites us is ultimately far more redeeming and compelling than anything that separates me. Because what had become clear to me, and I want you to know, it isn't always clear in the beginning, because as I said, I'd been on television since I was 19 years old. But around 94, I got really clear. So don't expect the clarity to come all at once, to know your purpose right away. But what became clear to me was that I was here on earth to use television and not be used by it. To use television to illuminate the transcendent power of our better angels. So 
This angel network, it didn't just change the lives of those who were helped, but the lives of those who also did the helping. It reminded us that no matter who we are or what we look like or what we may believe, it is both possible and more importantly, it, it becomes powerful to come together in common purpose and common effort. In our political system and in the media, we often see the reflection of a country that is polarized, that is paralyzed, and is self-interested. And yet, I know you know the truth. We all know that we are better than the cynicism and the pessimism that is regurgitated throughout Washington and the 24-hour cable news cycle. We understand that the vast majority of people in this country believe in stronger background checks because they realize that we can uphold the Second Amendment and also reduce the violence that is robbing us of our children. And we understand that most Americans believe in a clear path to citizenship for the 12 million undocumented immigrants who reside in this country because it's possible to both enforce our laws and at the same time embrace the words on the Statue of Liberty that have welcomed generations of huddle masses to our shores. We can do both. The point is, your generation is charged with this task of breaking through what the body politic has thus far made impervious to change. Each of you has been blessed with this enormous opportunity of attending this prestigious school. You now have a chance to better your life, the lives of your neighbors, and also the life of our country. When you do that, let me tell you what I know for sure. That's when your story gets really good. Maya Angelou always says, when you learn, teach. When you get, give. That, my friends, is what gives your story purpose and meaning. So you all have the power in your own way to develop your own angel network. And in doing so, your class will be armed with more tools of influence and empowerment than any other generation in history. I did it in an analog world. I was blessed with a platform that at its height reached nearly 20 million viewers a day. Now here in a world of Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Tumblr, you can reach billions in just seconds. I know you all understand better than most that real progress requires authentic, an authentic way of being, honesty, and above all, empathy. I have to say that the single most important lesson I learned in 25 years talking every single day to people was that there is a common denominator in our human experience. Most of us, I tell you, we don't want to be divided. What we want, the common denominator that I found in every single interview, is we want to be validated. We want to be understood. I've done over 35,000 interviews in my career. And as soon as that camera shuts off, everyone always turns to me and inevitably in their own way asks this question, was that okay? I heard it from President Bush. I heard it from President Obama. I've heard it from heroes and from housewives. I've heard it from victims and perpetrators of crimes. I even heard it from Beyonce and all of her Beyonce-ness. <laughs> she finishes performing, hands me the microphone and says, was that okay? <laughs> Friends and family, yours, enemies, strangers, in every argument, in every encounter, every exchange, I will tell you, they all want to know one thing. Was that okay? Did you hear me? Do you see me? Did what I say mean anything to you? So whether you call it soul or spirit or higher self intelligence, 
There is, I know this, there is a light inside each of you, all of us, that illuminates your very human beingness if you let it. No matter what challenges or setbacks or disappointments you may encounter along the way, you will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself as a human being. You want to max out your humanity by using your energy to lift yourself up, your family, and the people around you. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. From time to time, you may stumble, fall. You will for sure count on this. No doubt you will have questions and you will have doubts about your path. But I know this, if you're willing to listen, to be guided by that still small voice that is the GPS within yourself, to find out what makes you come alive, you will be more than okay. You will be happy, you will be successful, and you will make a difference in the world. The three things that I want to leave with you, just these three, I could do 10, I could do a whole life class, but just these three things, will carry you if you let them. First and foremost, knowing who you are. Knowing who you are. Being able to answer this question, who am I and what do I want? Who am I really? My answer is I am God's child. I am that which is born of all that is. I am, as Pierre de Chardin said, a spiritual being having a human experience. Come trailing the breath of the ancestors yet, but trailing the breath of the angels. And understanding that because I am connected to the source of all that is, all that is possible is possible for me. That's who I am. And what do I want? I don't want to just be successful in the world. I don't want to just make a mark or have a legacy. The answer to that question for me is, I want to fulfill the highest, truest expression of myself as a human being. I want to fulfill the promise that the Creator dreamed when He dreamed the cells that made up me. What do I want? You must have some kind of vision for your life. Even if you don't know the plan, you have to have a direction in which you choose to go. What I've learned is that's a great metaphor for life. You want to be in the driver's seat of your own life because if you're not, life will drive you. So, knowing who you really are in this space and time that we embody, that's number one. What do you want? Who are you? Number two, you must find a way to serve. Martin Luther King said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. Now we live in a world where everybody wants to be famous and where we admire people for just being famous. We think being known brings us value. The truth is all of that will fade in time. In three years, you won't be able to name the housewives of Atlanta. The real truth 
is that service and significance service and the significance that you bring to your service is that which is lasting so to be able to whatever your occupation or job or talent or gift is our honorees today getting doctor degrees to apparently opposite fields hiv and aids and the spoken word but what they have in common is service using the spoken word in service to community and the world using your knowledge and information about hiv and aids and medicine in service to the world and if you look at all the most successful people in the world whether they know it or not they have that paradigm of service everybody's talking about mark zuckerberg and the ipo service jz rapid service through the word to people through song for many years i was really just happy to be on tv and people would stop and say oh you on tv yeah i'm on tv i like being on tv it's a nice job and it was about the time that i received my honorary doctorate from spelman around 1993 so i don't know if that had something to do with it i thought of myself as dr winfrey that i went back and i took a long look at what it was i was doing on on TV and made a decision that I was no longer going to just be on TV but I was going to use TV as a platform as a force for good and not be used by TV and I will tell you my decision to make that significant change in the way I operated on television using television as a service changed my career exponentially service through medicine ser service through art using whatever it is you produce your product as a way of giving back to the world when you shift the paradigm of whatever it is you choose to do to service and you bring significance to that success will i promise you follow you service and significance equals success that's number 2 number 3 it's so simple but so hard to do always do the right thing be excellent people notice think of how you notice you go to taco bell somebody gives you extra napkin and some sauce you notice you want to go back to that person cuz even at Taco Bell excellence shows itself be excellent let excellence be your brand everybody talks about building a brand i never even knew what that was when people say you're a brand i would say no i'm just oprah what i recognize now is that my choice to in every way in every example in every experience to do the right thing and the excellent thing is what has created the brand and what i know is that when you are excellent you become unforgettable people remember you you stand out regardless of what it is you become an unforgettable woman and that is what we all want we want to be unforgettable and not forgettable. So doing the right thing even when nobody knows you're doing the right thing will always bring the right thing to you. I promise you that. Why? Because the third law of motion is always at work. For every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. That is so true in all of our lives. you just have to do the right thing and the right thing will follow you even when people don't support it i remember many times on my show there are many shows y'all never saw and the reason you didn't see them is because i got the last vote and i remember 2010 
my team, hardest working team in television, had done this interview with a woman who turns out she was a Sunday school teacher by day and a sex addict at night. And they were like, you won't believe it. We got her going out. We got her with the men and we get to show her and she was willing to show us everything. I sat down with a woman for an interview that was taped. And during the process of the interview, I said, why are you doing this? And she said, oh, I want to help people. I want to tell my story and I want to help people. I said, do you have children? She says, yes, I have a 10 year old son. I knew right then this is never going to see the light of day. So we got off the air and I said to the lady, we are not going to air that show. And she said, why? My producer said, why? She knew she was being filmed. She knew what she was saying. She knows what you, I said, because her son will never get over it. Her son will never get over it. And it's not worth a rating point to me. Not worth a rating point to me to know that there's a 10 year old boy who's destroyed because his mother went on the Oprah Winfrey show and told all her business. You do the right thing, even when other people think it may not be. And oftentimes when you make a decision to do the right thing, immediately you're faced with doubt. Was that the right thing? Was that the right decision? I don't know, was that the right thing? You always know it's the right thing when in the end there is peace. You are rewarded by peace in knowing that you did the right thing.